Hello, everyone. I'm Sam Ekman of Gold Derby. Here with me is Peter Hoare, the director of episode three of The Last of Us. Long, long time. Um, Peter, how does it feel to, to know that you have collectively made the world weep like small children with this episode? Were, were you tapped into that <laughs> reaction? Um, yeah, it was an incredible reaction. And I don't think I've ever... I don't think I've ever been in a position where I've been able to watch people watch something I've made and and react to it live because that seems to be a thing that happens a lot now. And uh, so people recorded themselves watching it for their experience. And I mean, it happens with bigger branded shows, I guess. And and Last of Us was one of those shows that had a huge following from the game. So I guess we we would probably expect that. And what was so gratifying, and I say this in a way that there's one, I don't want to find sound un, unkind or uncaring, but what was really gratifying is that people didn't expect it. I think they were expecting to to react to st shocks or scares or blood or whatever, you know, because it was a, 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 a the game is particularly violent um, at times, a survival game. So they were probably thought, okay, it's all going to be a bit of that and a bit of this, and some people are going to die. and. But but what happened in episode three was fundamentally life changing to some people, and uh, they they it was it was just wonderful to see how many things were talked about that you do sort of you do on set. You, you make choices on set. You make choices with actors, with with collaborators, and whatever. And and then you sometimes think no one ever notices. You sometimes think that that it's like just sails through, and and you know. It does well or it doesn't do well or whatever. But on this occasion, I was able to see things get talked about and mentioned and championed. And uh, and and yeah, you know, it was fantastic. Hmm. I, I think one of the reasons people were probably quite surprised with this episode is it's a huge departure from the hmm. game. Um, you know, we don't even get to meet Frank in the game, sadly. Uh, so were you aware of the story from the game? Was Did that kind of provide a lot of pressure to you to take this very different approach? Um, yeah, I do. I do know the game. I played the first game. I haven't played the second game yet. Um, was going to do that as soon as I finished filming. Uh, still haven't done it, but uh, partly because my director of photography friend, Evan Balter, spoils it for me. Well, he, I made oh, him do no. it. He said, he said, have you played the second game yet? And I went, no. And he went, oh. And I'm like, mm, that was a big O. Oh. Uh, why? Oh, I can't tell you. All right. And then I basically bullied it out of him. I said, you've got to tell me. Why Why is there something? And then he told me what happens in game two. And game two is pretty epic. So I thought, mm, I don't know if I want to do that yet. I'll wait. I'll pause that. And now the show has become so big. And obviously season two is coming. And I feel like I might want to watch that first. Because um, I, I'm very keen to see how they do it. It's a very different game it, it splits off into lots of different directions and so i'm really interested to see how how craig deals with that and i watch it as a viewer but uh but yeah i did know the game and i did i did know about bill it's funny because the bill's frank scenario had had sort of gone by me and and i couldn't remember all of the details so i went back online which is great while youtube exists so i was finding all these little cutscenes, and i, I was going de de delving and then it all came back to me and it's you know, and many people have made comment about about it. It's like in the game, Bill's Town is for you to get a car. That's really all it is. At the end of Bill's right. Town, you have a car and you can do more. And uh, in the episode, of course, it was considerably more involving than that emotionally because Bill and Frank told their story. Um, and this was, was the first departure, fundamental departure, not departure, actually, but 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 embellishment and, and and recreation because Craig had said to Neil, Neil Druckmann, the creator of the game, uh, I'm going to do it my way when I feel like it needs it. And otherwise I'm, I want to stick to the game because it's so great. And they, that's why they, they agreed on so much mm -hmm. because Craig didn't want to take, take away from the game. He just wanted to add where it was appropriate. And that's when, and that was the first big one was with Frank and, and Bill. And you're right, we don't see uh, Frank. We see him hanging, dead, uh, taking his own life because I think we assume, we're not told, but I think we assume that he was probably bitten and and therefore did not want to to, to, to see that happen. Uh, and then we find pornography under the seat of the car after the event. And then all of those things, so that was it really for me. I felt like I found out in retrospect that Bill was potentially a gay man. 
And so therefore I was like, oh, oh, uh, but that game doesn't let you think about it for too long. You have mm. to keep going and some, the car gets sideswiped and then you're suddenly fighting for your life again and then you move on. So yes, episode three was going to be different from that. And we told this whole story uh, in about, you know, 50 minutes, uh, this whole life story of survival in a totally different framework uh, compared to the rest. Because the whole thing is about survival, but... As Craig wisely says, it, if you're talking about survival, you have to know why you want to survive. What's it for? Because survival for no reason other than just survival is not it, it's not interesting. And and so we have to give people a purpose. And that's what Frank and Bill gave him as a writer. They're like, OK, how did that happen? I'm really interested. And uh, and that's how the episode came about. Yeah. And of course, they're surviving for love. And it is mm. just this epic, epic love story that you're telling here. Um, and it's really brought to to life quite brilliantly by by Nick Offerman and Murray Bartlett. What is Absolutely. what was it like charting that relationship with them? Because you're coming in for just one episode. These two actors are just coming in for one episode. Was there a lot of rehearsal time there to try and to build that what was the process well I would love to say that there was but um but that's not true uh there was not much time for us to do it I think you know uh casting is key um we we had to I mean Murray Bartlett was part of the team before before I was actually but but he uh had talked with Craig and of course HBO knew Murray this was before White Lotus and uh, before he had aired, it, it shot, but it hadn't aired. And so uh, HBO was saying, we think you should meet this guy because he's phenomenal. But what was great from, about Murray was, yes, he was phenomenal, but I don't think anyone expected him to be e even more phenomenal in this than he was in White Lotus, because they're very, very different roles. It's not like you would expect the man who who played Arnaud to, to be able to do um, this, but he did it and did it so well. But because Murray's... Well, both of them, both men have got incredible souls and hearts. And I think all they did is they read this script so beautifully written by Craig. And it was like, and Murray said this, it's like, it, it, it's the best roadmap as, as a performer, as a director, as a creator. You just see all the things you need. It's all there. And then you just go, right, OK, I know I know what to do. I just hope I can do it. And I think uh, and, and Nick's story was similar in the sense that he read it and went, wow, that's really good. But his first reaction was, I can't do this. Uh, I, and his wife, uh, Megan, who I owe a lot to now, is is the one that went, oh, let me read it. Yeah, you're going. You're going to Calgary. <laughs> Get, go. He, she basically just said he'd be an idiot not to do it. And um, I would never say he was an idiot, but she can say that um but i yeah thank goodness she did and and he was also phenomenal but again you don't know that you know because someone at nick's level you don't speak to them you have to offer them the role and that's fair enough but you sort of go we were all looking at each other going nick offerman's perfect for 90 percent of this role it's just that 10 percent of of the part of it that you're like is he gonna go for that is he gonna relax is he gonna be okay and blah 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 but then came, of course, Murray, and part of that was also Murray was so giving and generous and warm and good hearted. And there was a sort of meta element to this because Nick had never done a part like this. He'd never played a gay role. He'd never played a, a role that, that, that had all of those elements to it. And of course, Murray had done it a lot. So they were he was helping Nick. Murray was helping Nick in the same way Frank helps Bill. So I think a lot of that comes through, a lot of that, that sort of normal hesitation and, and nervousness not about playing gay but about getting it right i think that's what nick was worried about he was worried about getting it right and not selling it underselling it overselling it and that's you know that's where i come in again and i just sort of mold things and and and, and keep people you know comfortable in enabling the best performances i can i was able to have a decent schedule which tv is never as that long but i think it's probably the longest it ever gets with hbo we had 20 days and we were and we were shooting what felt like a little sundance movie compared to the rest of the series which was some you know epic stuff so uh yeah you know i think casting getting casting right and then giving it the space to do its thing so uh yeah that's how we did it yeah I think too that maybe that ten percent uh, that was unknown with Nick is that like there's a very deep vulnerability to this character mm. and kind of mm. simplicity, um, which I think 
comes out maybe my one of my favorite scenes is the strawberry patch moment yes uh because you just see bill melt you know finally uh completely yeah. melt away what was it there's there's so much being told on his face without <laughs> being said what was it like shooting that that was really truly magical i mean we had lots of moments of magic on on that shoot and i was fully fully focused on the work as i always would be but i remember thinking uh i'm, I'm only, look we as creators are always asking ourselves am i doing it right should i do more should i do less or whatever but i was always uh, i always felt gratified when i would look to my right and to my left and they would basically be craig mason writer and producer and his producer jack lesko and they were both in tears most of the time. And so I was like, if they're crying this much, it has to be good. And Craig knew what was coming. He wrote it. So if he's fully immersed himself emotionally in this moment, I'm like, mm, this is good. This is good. And that was one of those pivotal moments in the shoot. And obviously we, we shot it as the sun was going down. Um, we weren't really sure how well the sun was going to play on because you never do because it, it could be a cloudy day or whatever and the sun was just about making an appearance and then it went behind some trees and we were like oh no it's not quite but anyway we had this wonderful open moment of about 20 minutes and that's when we shot that scene so again we didn't have a lot of time we we could have spent a lot longer but sometimes something magic happens when it isn't about overshooting and it's about finding a moment and that moment just fell into place it felt beautiful the light was beautiful they were beautiful nick did this gorgeous little giggle when he ate that that strawberry which came from where i don't know but it just felt like you know we shot it with two cameras that ran all the time and 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 we just shot perhaps three or four different setups uh within those 20 minutes and it just focused them both i think it really made them feel that moment and uh and and it was yeah it was something very special you also have another special moment where you get to introduce i think a lot of people to linda ronstadt which uh <laughs> I, I don't know yeah. i don't know why uh certain people didn't know who linda ronstadt was but it was great fun watching murray kind of come in there being like mm -hmm. i'm the this i'll introduce you to this <laughs> game on uh yes. but is actually a terrible player <laughs> what was it like uh watching them bounce off each other in that scene well uh, yeah i mean that was actually you said about rehearsal that's the only thing we did in rehearsal because mm. we had somebody working with us for the music and and nick uh is isn't a professional player in any way i think he can he he understands it all but he wanted time to play and practice to get it to do justice um now as it turned out in the vinyl version he doesn't uh play the music uh, it, it, it's a different pianist, but but we actually had the double hands do it. So the sound is real. It comes from that piano and it comes in, it, it, you hear it in that room, which again adds authenticity. It wasn't added on later. But um, but he did learn to do it though. And it was like, he was all up for it. But I think it just made sense on the day to have it played into him. So he heard, he heard the track he was singing to and it was about the voice. That really mattered. So he had a few lessons there. We also had to teach or rather unteach Murray because Murray was way better than it sounded. So Murray has a great voice and is a great player. So he had to learn to do it badly. And, and that was really funny too. Um, and Craig Craig had found that song through a friend of his. He has a, a friend whose name I'm never, I'm not gonna remember, but he's a music guy and and Craig was writing the, 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 the script and said, I need a piece of music that says this, 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 and this, and very specific. And, the, and this guy went, Linda Ronstadt, long, long time. It's like, oh, and now, of course, everybody's like, well, of course it was Linda Ronstadt. But 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 those things, again, they they happen because of collaboration and understanding and, 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 you know, discovery. And I knew Linda Ronstadt. I didn't know that particular track. And uh, I think playing it again at the end was obviously really, really beautiful. And then the bit that I sort of, you know, put in as part of that end was the, the the pullback through the window which we discussed as a motif to lead each show uh we discussed the window frame as being something that we would lead each show with but it turned out that i i, I just thought i can't lead this show that way but i could end it that way <laughs> so that's how that came about and again you don't always get the opportunity to do this because that particular shot involved building an entire fake wall with a window frame in the right place to get the right view um as opposed to just shooting out of one of the windows of that house because uh, which was also built for us by the way so 
it's all of those little details that that come together it's like you know I want to do a window shot. Great. Okay. Where are you going to do it? Oh, the window in the house doesn't work. Can you build me a window? Oh, okay. Where do you want it? Well, it needs to be up this high on some scaffolding and it needs to, oh, okay. Right. <laughs> never so, simple. It's never simple as it looks, but that's part of the joy. That is all, you know, you, you're not supposed to see how we did it. It's supposed to come together in a, you know, in an immaculate way. But I just love the fact that we could tell, tie that story up because, you know, lots of people were worried I was going to show you the decaying bodies or something, but mm. no. It was just an image, a simple image from inside the house, maybe from the spiritual point of view of the two people that lived there. And it saw the, the, the flowers, which were dying but or dead, but, but they were there. And the painting, the little sketch of Bill, which also reminded you of, of what they did together and how they lived together. And, and I think, and hearing Linda Ronstadt, seeing the car drive away, the truck driving away was just too good to miss. Mm. Well, it makes me think of, um, you know, you directed It's a Sin, another fantastic series, which you won a BAFTA for, um, which is obviously these characters dealing with intense mm -hmm. loss, but also intense connection in the AIDS crisis. And that's another, I think this episode explores that type of theme in a much different way. But is that a theme that you think there's there's something there for you that you're drawn to? Um, I, I, I guess, I guess... Uh... I don't know. Honestly, I, I I feel like I'm I'm now drawn very much to queer stories, which I hadn't been before. Uh, I am a gay man. I, I I've always been a gay man, <laughs> obviously, but but in my career too. And sometimes people are not always able to to live their truth within a within a work within a workplace because it can feel uncomfortable, unfortunately. And I have been lucky enough to not have that. But but at the same time, I actually said this to Russell T. Davis, who wrote It's a Sin. I said on on It's a Sin. I felt truly myself for the first time ever. And like, you know, I'm not young anymore. And, and that was sort of a bit of a thing. And he was really moved by that. He was like, oh my God, that's so important. And I guess that's part of it. I, I had a, a story I could speak to. I could, you know, I was talking and, and, and working with these young actors who'd never experienced that. Obviously they weren't born anywhere near it. And uh, and thankfully that's true. You know, thankfully they didn't have to live through that horrible crisis. You know, then we had a pandemic, which was, on a par but but um but yeah it was teaching them if you like teaching is probably too strong a word but letting them learn of 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 how awful it was and i i do remember one point where i talked to them about this documentary a bbc documentary that i recommended they watch uh that was all shot in new york in 1981 and this sort of intrepid bbc journalist had heard about this strange thing that was killing men he didn't put it to 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 gay men actually he just he just knew it was happening in Greenwich and it was like, well, you know, and we know now why that was happening, but he called it the killer in the village. And it was like, why is this thing happening? And it was obviously, that's why good journalism exists because this person knew something wasn't right. And, uh, and, and, but the tragic thing is you're watching these young men talk about themselves and say, look, I've got these marks on my body and I don't know why. And a friend of mine had these and he died, but another friend of mine, he didn't have anything like this. And he also died. And now, you know, they're all gone. All of those voices in that documentary all must have died within a year of it being made. M most probably. You can't say for certain, but most probably. And I was telling this story to my cast and I just was like so emotional looking at their faces because they were all sat there in this period location, in period costume. And I'm like, it would have been you. <laughs> you would have all, you could have all most likely died. And... I was so emotional looking at it and I just felt like that you can't get better than to have a story that's so powerful and feel it so well. And, and I think that's again where Last of Us came in. I felt it. So I mean, because and lots of people picked up on this. It, it, it was not just a romance, a love story set in, in this sort of apocalypse. It was a, a middle aged one. They were, they were two gray bearded men that fell in love. And I'm like, oh, hello. So <laughs> it's like I felt like. That story is also very profound and, and and it's universal. It's not about men. It's about everybody. It's finding love wherever against all the odds and and knowing what love is when you find it and 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 like leaning into it and uh and what you can have. And and of course the end, they chose their end. They chose they it was about euthanasia as well. And so, whoa, what a story to put in the middle of this incredible, you know, uh, apocalyptic 
survival tale. And, and I mean, obviously, you know, the whole episode works as well because it's bookended so beautifully by Pedro and Bella. It isn't just about those two men. It, it, you learn in that final sequence with, with Joel and Ellie that it's about, you know, don't, don't miss the people you're there for. You're there to protect the ones you love. And he, of course, thinks immediately of Tess, but actually it, the other person is right in front of him. It's Ellie. That's the new person. He It's so prophetic in that way. And who would have thought Bill would be the person to teach him that lesson? <laughs> so right. yeah, just just a beautiful script, a beautiful script, and uh, I you know I can't thank them enough for just having the opportunity to do it. Well, a beautiful script and beautiful job bringing it to life. So thank you, Peter, for for sitting thank down talking much. Last of Us with me. Everyone you, who's Sam. watching, subscribe to Gold Derby. Keep with us. There's plenty more conversations like this, Peter. Thank you so much again. Thanks, Sam.